Lord Jesus, uphold me, that I might uplift thee. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus our Lord, so I went through a phase, probably roughly five to ten years old, where I was certain, I was certain that what I wanted to be when I grew up was either a carpenter or a mechanic. And there's no mystery as to why I wanted to do this. It's because power tools are awesome. And to a young boy, the sight of all these power tools was incredible. So I wanted to be either a mechanic or a carpenter because those were the men at our church that I saw using all the power tools. Excuse me. All right, I'm not going to sneeze. So, I also clearly remember the day when I realized, this is, bear with me. I also remember the day when I realized that I could never be a carpenter or a mechanic because I had gotten into sixth grade and I really was not liking math. And I remember asking the gentleman at our church who was a mechanic, do you have to know math to do your job? And he said, oh yeah, I wish I knew more about it. And I, well, I guess I'm not doing that. And I didn't. And I bring that up because it illustrates to me a thought that is kind of important. I was going to do something at one point in my life, but that is no longer part of my life. And when you think about it, there's so many wases in your life. As we grow older, we accumulate more and more wases into our life. That may not be the greatest English sentence I've ever crafted, but it's true. We accumulate more wases into our lives. I was, you know, seven once upon a time. Not anymore. I was the proud owner of an 8-track collection. Not anymore. I was convinced that Kool-Aid was the greatest drink ever. Not any, well, that one may be still, still true. As we grow older, we accumulate more wases into our life. Now, a lot of them are humorous, but some of them sting. I was the grandson of a very loving grandfather. But he's gone now. And that was hurts a little bit more. And brothers and sisters, I bring this up this morning because in our text for today, Jesus, our Savior, gives us the answer, an answer of simple brilliance against all the wases and everything that passes in this world and death itself. And he reminds us that he is our God permanently. There's no was in it. It's permanently. He's our God. Now our text for today is from Luke chapter 20. And it's part of an extended conversation between Jesus and several members of the religious authority. And if you ever have a chance to read Luke 20 at home, it's a very interesting chapter. It takes place during the original Holy Week. So Jesus is about to suffer and die. And there's a lot of people in Jerusalem at the time to celebrate the Passover. So there's plenty of crowds. And in Luke chapter 20, the different segments of the Jewish religious authority publicly come at Jesus and try and trap him. So the chapter starts out with the teachers of the law coming to Jesus and saying, by what authority do you do these things? And then Jesus puts that question aside. Then later the Pharisees come up to him and they ask him the question, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? They're trying to trap him. Jesus puts that one aside. And then it is the Sadducees' turn. The Sadducees come before him with their question. And that is where our text begins. Listen as I read the first few verses of the Sadducees' question. In verse 27, some of the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to Jesus with a question. Teacher, they said, 
Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife but no children, the man must marry the widow and have children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first one married a woman and died childless. The second and then the third married her. And in the same way the seven died, leaving no children. Finally, the woman died too. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be, since the seven were married to her? Now, brothers and sisters, as you notice in the first verse, verse 27, Luke comes out and tells us that the Sadducees do not believe there is a resurrection. The Sadducees were a party in the Jewish religion who had really taken a liking to Greek philosophy. And because of that, they believed there was no afterlife. This is all we got. There's no resurrection. There are no angels or demons. And this had led to a pretty big debate with the Pharisees. I'm, I'm talking like 50 years worth. They had been debating with each other, and the main debate that the Sadducees kept saying was, there is no resurrection, and you cannot prove that there is one from the Torah, from the Bible. And this had become a huge question between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So they come to Jesus today, and look at what they're doing. They're trying to kill two birds with one stone. They're trying to stump Jesus and make the Pharisees look stupid at the same time. Because remember, Jesus has already, the Pharisees have already come to him with a question. He's already pushed them away. This is in public, ladies and gentlemen. If the Sadducees come out now and they stump Jesus, they also make their opponents, the Pharisees, look bad. This is two birds with one stone. And so they give him a question, dripping with sarcasm. Dripping with sarcasm. Hey, Jesus... Wink, wink. Yeah, there's no resurrection, but let's say there's a woman with seven husbands. They, re they don't really care about the marriage aspect of the question. What they want to show is that the resurrection from the dead is stupid. That's their point. And brothers and sisters, it is right here where your Savior gives an answer of such brilliant simplicity that it literally crushes all opposition. Listen again to how Jesus responds to them. Jesus replied, The people of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in that age and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise. For he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. Now notice the first thing Jesus does is he gets the marriage part out of the way because he knows that that's a smokescreen. That's a veneer. They don't really care about the moral implications of that marriage question, so Jesus treats with that first, and then he gets to the heart of the matter. He gets to the point that they're really after. And what's very interesting, brothers and sisters, the Sadducees start out this conversation by quoting Moses. And then Jesus shows them how you really quote Moses. And he quotes Exodus 3, verse 6, where God is talking to Moses and he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, dear friends, if you're wondering, or if it isn't obvious at first, where's the proof of the resurrection in that passage? Well, this is what Jesus means. This is Jesus' point. When God said to Moses, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he didn't say, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
when they were alive, but now that they're dead, I'm your God, Moses. That's Jesus' point. When God said that phrase, Abraham was already dead. So God should have said, I was the God of Abraham. He didn't say that. He said, I am. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the implication was, Moses, Abraham may be dead in reference to you, not to me. Jesus gives this simple reply. He is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And dear friends, what's interesting (laughs) is that this reply pretty much silenced everyone. Everybody was wowed when Jesus said this. He crushed all opposition. I mean, look at the last two verses. Some of the teachers of the law responded, Well said, teacher. And no one dared to ask him any more questions. I wouldn't either. I wouldn't either. I mean, one of the morals we can take from this text this morning is don't get into a debate with the Son of God. But look at how the Pharisees themselves reacted. The men who had hated Jesus, hunted him his whole life. And even they are like, that was good. That was good. We hate this guy, but he just shut them Sadducees up. Everyone is blown away by this. And brothers and sisters, when you look at all of this, you have to ask yourself, just what was the Sadducees' problem? And the truth of the matter is that they had gotten so used to this world where everything passes, where everything becomes a was because it doesn't last, they had become so trapped in their mindset that they totally denied the existence of an afterlife. They totally denied God's promise of a resurrection. And what's even worse, they had gotten to the point where they openly mocked it. They mocked God's promise of this. They mocked the promise of eternal life. And brothers and sisters, that's an attitude that we always need to be aware of. We need to be aware of an attitude like that. Because finally, this world we're in is not a joke. Nor is it a paradise. This world is neither a joke nor a paradise. What this world is, is a death trap. That's what it is. I mean, think about it. The second you're born into this world, well, your destiny now is to die and leave it. This world is a death trap because of sin, because we're sinners, and that's what this fallen world has become. So that everything in it becomes a was. Brothers and sisters, it's so true. The older we get, the more we accumulate was's into our life. And some of them are humorous or not a big deal. A lot of them sting. And they sting greatly. And they cut at our hearts. And I know some of you here Some of the was's in your life, you were the happy spouse of someone you loved and they were taken from you. And that's something that you were. That's a was in your life that you don't want to deal with and it hurts. Or some of you were the friend of someone who you deeply cared for and they were taken from you. Or you were the proud child of a parent that you looked up to your whole life and they were taken from you. Or some of you even were parents of children who you loved and they were taken from you. All of us have wases in our life that sting our heart. And to realize more than anything that I will be a was. 
That's the final truth, is that each one of us is going to become a was. A time is coming, whether it's 60 years from now or next week, where I will be a was. Or they will say, Pastor Zarling was a pastor, a husband, a friend, a son, whatever. Not anymore, because he is gone. Everything in this world passes. Nothing is permanent. It's a death trap. And is it any wonder then, when you look at that, that most people's answer today is to just throw up their hands in despair and say, well, there's no afterlife, there's no meaning, there's no God, because it's a very depressing picture of what you see this life to be. If I can't find anything permanent with my eyes, well, then I guess nothing must be permanent. And yet, brothers and sisters, I have the joy of telling you this morning that there is one who's permanent. Your God. And was, the word was, does not apply to him. Dear friends, do you see the beauty of the promise that Jesus gives us this morning? The beauty of the promise that God gave you in Exodus 3. Look at what God's doing. He's talking to Moses about people who have died, and so it's the exact spot where God should use the word was. He should say, if he's using good grammar, I was the God of Abraham. And he refuses to do so. He doesn't say that. He says, I am the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I am their God. And I do not allow was to come into this relationship. He is the eternal one, and because of his love for us, his permanency, his eternal life, he gives it to us. He gives it to his children. And he did that through his son Jesus, who died on the cross not only to forgive all of our sins and to take the punishment for us, but also so that he could rise on Easter Sunday and beat death, beat the thing that makes us wases, makes us a was. The permanency of your God the promise here, is, it's the same thing as when Jesus says, because I live, you will live. It's the same thing. It's God saying, because I am permanent. Because I am unending life. And because I love you. Through Jesus' blood, I give that to you. I give life to you. And in the waters of baptism, he took you and bound you to himself. There is never a time, there will never be a time when he is not your God. There will never be a time when you can't say, I'm God's child. You're never going to say, I was God's child. You are his child. For in love, God has back, backhanded was out of the room. He has shoved death straight into the street. He has gotten them away from you. He is your God permanently. And finally, dear friends, this morning, as we celebrate saints triumphant, our brothers and sisters who are now at their reward in heaven and they've gone before us, and today, today in celebrating their memory, we get to say this sentence. And it's true. He is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Don Hansen and Sam Carter and Lisa Hansen and Sherry Sorensen. Not he was their God, he is. And he is our God, permanently. And there is no was in that relationship. Amen. Would you